So welcome to the seminar. Uh, our speaker today is Jay Johnson from CR Security. Uh, by the way, his company CEO is also here. Where is Tom? Uh, Tom stepped out for a moment. CEO is also here. So he's going to talk about cybersecurity vulnerabilities for any challenges. It's a new problem. I guess I'm blocking everybody in view from over here. Okay. Am I blocking the view? No, no, I'm I'm blocking your view. <laughs> Okay, I would like to remind everyone that the next seminar is next week, next week, uh, next Thursday. I'll send out a reminder. Now for those uh, who are joining us online, uh, for some reason the chat is not working. So use the Q&A feature. Uh, post your questions and some of the questions will be addressed and answered at the end of the presentation. A quick introduction. Uh, Jay is a CTO at DL Security. Uh, this is a, a startup company focused on DL communication, power operations, and security. Uh, Jay was a distinguished member of technical staff at Sandia National Lab. When he led research projects totaling $25 million in power system control, optimization, and security. Jay received his bachelor in mechanical engineering from the University of Missouri. Oh, no. Uh, and his master in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech in 2009. So, without further delay, I'll let uh, Jay share your share the slides and you. Thank you. Awesome. Do a little quick theme change here. Looking good? Yeah. All right, awesome. I think the mic is somewhere here, so if you, you want to... So I need to stand back a little? People can hear me online? Let me all roll this. Let's try to get folks on this side viewing angles. All right. Um, it's really awesome to be here talking about cybersecurity for EV chargers. Um, as, as was said, it's a relatively new area, but there's a lot of interesting work that's gone on over the last decade or so in this space. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, plus some personal work that I've done in this space. Um, I spent uh, 13 years at Sandia National Laboratories, and really that's the beginning portion of this talk, is talking about a lot of the electric vehicle penetration testing work that we were doing, EV charger uh, testing work. And then the latter portion of the presentation, I'll be talking about DER Security Corp and where we're going in terms of the defenses for uh, EV chargers and other distributed energy resources, the DER and DER Security Corp. So talk a little bit about background, where we stand with EV charging rollout. That's, as I'm sure everybody here is well aware, there's more and more EV chargers every day. Um, different attack vectors for these EVSEs or electric vehicle supply equipment. So if you see EVSE, just think EV charger. Uh, potential impacts, that's both on the power system, financial impacts, impacts to reputation, et cetera. And then some guidance that's out there in terms of how to do this better. So as, um, as many of you know, uh, EV chargers, there's a tremendous demand for it. Back in 2000, uh, 21, we had about 46,000. We're up to 62,000. I just checked the DOE website, putting putting together these slides. But we have a demand for 600,000 chargers here in 2030. And so the Biden administration, uh, with their uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, have uh, put in a tremendous amount of funding to roll out these EV chargers, especially on interstates, 
And the objective is to put um, 500,000 chargers out there and make sure that there's a EV charging, DC fast EV charger every 50 miles of interstate highway across the country, right? So um, as part of that, each of the states submit their plans for how to do these rollouts. And in those um, submissions are guidance or recommendations in terms of cybersecurity for those states or their strategy to approach it. And what you'll find is um, those tend to be pretty light in terms of their security recommendations and guidance and their approach to it. And so that's um, one of the areas I'll talk about here at the end is how we could do better in terms of uh, coming up with uniform recommendations for the country on how to do better in the space. So there, so we, maybe people in their head are thinking, okay, you know, level one, level two charger, it's in my garage, I plug in my car at night. Okay, that's nice. Now we're talking about much larger systems in general or, or the work that I've been doing. And so um, 350 kilowatt systems, megawatt charging is coming. And so there's a lot of talk about this from the Charing group. So you can see the megawatt charging system standard is being developed now. Uh, here you've got a large um, uh, DC uh, charging station where you've got, you know, semi class seven and eight trucks. You've got uh, school buses. There's a big push now for electrifying uh, school buses. And how you deliver this much power, if we're, if we're talking about multiple megawatts in a very um, tight area is difficult um, for several reasons. But one of the big things is the, the total load on the power system at that location. You pretty much need to place this right next to a, a substation or you're going to get uh, pretty, pretty um, massive swings in terms of the voltage there. And so you, you, you can kind of see the architecture of a lot of these things. So you put a substation and what they're going to do is most likely co-locate uh, battery storage or energy storage systems there so that they can uh, reduce the total demand on the grid at those locations. So think about, you know, middle of nowhere and, you know, Kansas or, or pick, pick a Midwest state and you've got a relatively uh, weak power system, weak grid there along the interstate highways. So how are you going to manage that if you've got a bunch of tractor trailers? Uh, all charging at the same time. And so those are some of the concerns that they have in dealing with this, with this local capability. So what are, what are these things made of? If you, if you tear off the panels and take a look at them. Okay, typically you'll have a couple of uh, DC couplers. So here's a CHAdeMO and a CCS coupler. Inside this thing, you're gonna find generally a cell connection. So a cellular backhaul network will run from the top of this thing. Um, there's an internal network that could be CAN or some other uh, protocol running there, oftentimes in the clear. Uh, then you've got um, an HMI, human machine interface, or the place that you press buttons and tell it what you want and what you want to do. Maybe a RFID swipe or a credit card swipe. And then Behind what you don't see in a lot of these things, and this one in particular, right, is there's there's a place where there's actually the energy conversion. And so the stuff that's coming here out of these couplers is actually DC power. So the connection to the power grid, the AC side, is in these large power cabinets. Sometimes, like the charge points, you've got you got uh, a stack of of these power conversion devices at the bottom. But in a lot of the larger ones, like the Electrify America ones, the kind of 250 kilowatt and larger, you're going to see these things set back, like go to go to the Walmarts and the other places, and you'll see these big boxes right next to the EV chargers. And so that on my screen. Um, and so the way the way that you deliver the power uh, to the vehicle is actually through like uh, fiber optic communications here and then DC lines that run beneath it. And then you get these power stages here and off, often they have, you know, several, six, eight different power uh, conversion devices that you can pull out. So all those, why am I telling you all this? Well, that's where we're about to go right now is all the vulnerabilities associated with these things. Okay, so if you've been watching the news recently, 
Uh, you've probably heard a lot about the FBI talking about the threats on the power grid, threats to our uh, critical infrastructures from various nation states. Here you can see some distributed energy resources related um, news articles that are out there. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of these, but it's kind of putting this back in the general con uh, context of the national dialogue and what's going on. And so some of the vulnerabilities I'll be talking about here are related to a, a, a paper that we published in Energies and then uh, actually was discussed in a Wired article and some other news outlets. So if you are curious about the technical details, you can dive in there. And if you want just a, a more uh, general sense of what's going on, please take a look at that uh, Wired article. It's a pretty good one. Okay, so four primary interfaces that we're going to talk about. First one is the couplers, the actual connection to the vehicle. Next one is user terminals. So um, I'm, I'm the EV driver. I come up to it. I have to swipe a a credit card, I have to beat my RFID tag, I have to do something there. That is also a, a vulnerable interface. Uh, network uh, connections, internet-based connections, often with that either Wi-Fi connection, um, EVSE, EVSE connections, or the backhaul network, so cellular network, and then maintenance terminals. Uh, and th these things are generally never exposed um, in some rare cases, you, we, we've seen that, uh, but typically you have to tear off the panel and actually connect to like JTAG ports or USB ports inside it. And so for each of these, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things you can do. All right, so here's where, it's, here's where we get into it. So first one, a uh, couple of amazing papers from the University of Oxford have come out in the last couple of years. The first one is uh, some work that they did where they used um, software-defined radios to pick up RF uh, broadcast. I guess I need to back up a little bit. So when you when you plug in a CCS um, connector, the combo charging thing, it's there's an, kind of like the AC thing, and then you see the two DC ports. This is mainly for uh, U.S. manufacturers, different from the Chatmo X one. I don't know if anybody. Hopefully you looked at these. Uh, so Chatmo uses CAN bus, so that runs in the clear. You can you can sniff that traffic if you tap into it. CCS actually puts a communication protocol stack on that communications, and they use it using Homeplug GreenFi. Homeplug GreenFi is a, a similar technology to Powerline Communications, where you can have these modules where you like plug one in on this side of your house and plug one in on that side. So you can actually run internet through the, the electrical cables in your home. <clears throat> and so it's very similar to that where you're actually communicating over the CC, over the, over the conductors in that charging cable. And so when you're broadcasting home plug green five, you can pick up an RF signal from them and you can sniff that. And so any of the session IDs or information that's being passed over that you can you can snip. Now what gets interesting is these things are ripe for PII, personally identifiable information, and billing information and charging levels and who who the vehicle is and so forth. So sniffing that is is a somewhat big deal. Now what what got very interesting is the University of Oxford took it a step further. Uh, not just sniffing, but actually actively broadcasting noise to essentially deny charging for these systems. And so you plug in, say, all right, looks like it's running, step away. And what they did is they broadcast an RF signal that would terminate that charging session. You can see some of the stopped, um, stopped charging uh, pictures here for the chargers. And that's that's what their setup looks like. And so you can, you know, they, they were theorizing about different ways that this could be used or weaponized, but you could have a drive-by attack where you have a car broadcasting this message and you just stop all the chargers everywhere that you go it's in the in the kind of blast radius, which turns out to be they tested at, at uh, 47 meters. Uh, you could be nearby. Uh, you could you could actually be across the street, so it's that remote attack. And what really scared us at the at the national labs is thinking about in these um, areas where you have large depots, say like a UPS, or if you had 
um, you know, FedEx or something, and you're charging 800 vehicles overnight, and you did something like this, the next day, all the vehicles aren't charged. And so that's a huge disruption to that, that uh, system operations. All right, so, so still on the EV connectors, um, there, there's some other things that you can do here uh, on the CCS thing. And so because you have that communication protocol, you can actually tap in to that connector and direct traffic back up through the HomePlug GreenPy card at the top of the device and into the brains of the system, which is typically attached to the back of the HMI, the human machine interface. And so what, what has been done and shown is potential risks. So whatever software is parsing that, those protocols that are reaching the, the brains of the operation, if there's a vulnerability associated with that, you, you have a way to inject traffic there. So log4j, other vulnerabilities associated with that, X, XXE attacks, XML related things could be potentially done uh, on, that, on that connection. So interesting story here. So I, I, I was leading a, um, uh, the, the red team effort for this joint lab project funded by the DOE cyber office, where we had um, INL developing uh, blue team defensive strategies and Sandia playing the, the bad guys. And so we were, we were working uh, on, on coming up with several exploits here. And uh, one of the things we had hypothesized is that you could actually, you know, connect to these charging um, connectors and, and get traffic in there, but we never really closed the loop and got the home plug green pie transmissions working. And this guy, Jake, who, who worked at INL, he comes out uh, as, we're, as we're demoing some of this stuff. And he's like, I think I got this working, check this out. And so he, he does a thing where he can actually get traffic to the brains of the system, SSH through that connector. And it, it was very impressive because we're, you know, all the red teamers are hanging out and Jake the intern shows up and just goes to show you, you know, the young kids will, will show the old guys any day of the week how to do this hack. Did you double his salary? Huh? Did you double his salary? Uh, it wasn't my decision. Probably should have. All right, so next up. Uh, user authentication mechanism. So the driver shows up to this thing. How are you going to tell the charger that you should be billed? Well, you can do a few things. You can swipe a credit card. Okay, that's that's well known. You get skimmers, shimmers, things like that that can track it. No different really from normal gas pumps. Uh, then you've got your RFID tags. So like uh, you've seen like a charge point or other RFID tag, you go bleep. And it, it's tied to your credit card information. So the problem here is RFID is not very secure. You, even your phones can do like near field communications, right? If you check into a hotel and you're like, okay, you know, give me my car key or my you know, room key, and you hit the button and you can hold it up to the door and it'll unlock it for you. Same thing can be done here where you just clone those things. So like there's there's these hacker tools like Proxmark 3 other things where you can clone that RFID tag. And if it's tied to your credit card, basically somebody could just go charge their vehicle on your credit card. So have to worry about that. Phones um, often will use some sort of API call to the back end. And those APIs are tend to be very, um, there have been a lot of exploits um, and, and vulnerabilities discussed in the API world. So um, there were, 16 vehicle manufacturers, I think, that were recently uh, notified that there were problems with their APIs after, after somebody did a pretty thorough assessment of this. And so, yes, your, your, your large auto manufacturers, but also your EV charging companies have these things where if you don't properly secure that and, and prevent people from enumerating all the devices out there and, and, um, and, and basically ensuring that every transaction is appropriately authenticated and authorized, you get into some of these problems. And then plug and charge, that's this beautiful idea that you can plug in your charger. There's cryptographic information on your EV charger. There's cryptographic information on your vehicle. That talks and they say, okay, we know who's who. We know you're you, you're you. Okay, it's tied to your billing account, done. Yeah. And tons and tons of turmoil and arguments about how to make this interoperability work along with the public key infrastructure associated with it. So there's there's challenges there as well. So that, that might be in the end, one of the better ways to go about this. 
All right, so internet interfaces. So this is the up back backhaul communications connection through the cell network. So we've got cross-site scripting issues, uh, you know, basically all your, your web-based issues that you hear in the news all the time about various websites being um, compromised. These things also exist for these devices. And so Tony Nasser from uh, uh, Concordia University up in Montreal is doing a lot of work on these things and, and discovered that there were quite a few issues. Um, some of the, actually I have it on the next slide here. Um, so some of the, the manufacturers, there are several of these vehicle charging um, systems on the internet and they were able to find that a, a large number of them had these types of problems associated with them. Also, INL did some awesome early work, I think 2000, no, uh, yeah, about 2018, I think they published this work, um, where there were problems with missing authentication when connecting to the device. Um, there were <laughs> uh, logging credentials being passed in the clear, so you could actually sniff those if you're monitoring the traffic. Unsanitized login fields were, uh, uh, you could you could do SQL injection attacks, which would actually dump databases associated with the SQL database, and and you could hijack sessions and so forth. So those are some of the problems. And and what they what Tony Nasser found in his in his uh, master's thesis was that he identified that about 92% of these um, charging system management uh, char star charging station management systems uh, were, were vulnerable to remote exploitation and uh, could, could give you access to the underlying EV systems. So that, that's actually a pretty staggering number. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. But here's uh, a kind of a mapping of these systems, uh, the, the vendors and which uh, vulnerabilities they had. So critical, high, and medium. And you can see several Several of the devices that he found on the internet had critical vulnerabilities associated with them, and he found about 14,000 hosts online. All right, so next up are more internet-related uh, issues. So, so some, some problems associated with these ma maintenance terminals and local inter internet connections. So imagine you've got a device here, there's uh, you know, some sort of communication inside that you can plug into the ethernet jack. There's often switches and then um, communicate to the devices that way. So I now found that you could connect a USB drive to one of those maintenance terminals and it would just dump out the firmware to you for free. Um, in other cases, it actually uh, dumped, uh, let's see, is that one on here? Yeah, it dumps other information when connecting it. It's very handy for debugging, but not very secure. Um, modifying uh, firmware of the devices, uh, authorization didn't require firmware signing, that's actually very common, and then firmware downgrade attacks. And so this, this picture off to the right here is the structure for doing code signing, which essentially ties a particular binary, typically a binary, to the, the author of that through a, a a public key infrastructure and associated signing. And probably don't have enough time to go through that. So we'll move on. All right, so here's, here's a great uh, example of malicious firmware updates and supply chain vulnerabilities. So in the very beginning couple of weeks of the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, there was um, some EV chargers along the M11 corridor that runs from Moscow to St. Petersburg, I wanna say, if I remember right. Um, and so these EV chargers had some components in them that were outsourced to a Ukrainian company to be manufactured. So they, they said, okay, you know, I don't know, some component inside this device that does, you know, maybe the credit card swipes. Um, you're, you're, you're going to, you know, manufacture this, and then they maintain a per persistent connection to those EV chargers, most likely uh, for like firmware updates and other things. But once the, the conflict broke out, they decided, okay, well, we're going to just update these devices to uh, prevent any charging of any kind and also display pro 
uh, Ukraine anti-Putin messages. And so there's this great video online of somebody, you know, in, in Russian saying, I don't know what's going on. It says, you know, down with uh, Russia, glory to Ukraine, and I can't charge here. What's going on? So that's that's what happened there. All right, so more maintenance interfaces. Uh, I'm just going to tell a, two quick stories here. One is uh, the Fraunhofer, um, their uh, research institute out of Germany. They basically discovered that they could plug in a USB and it would copy off some logs that included very sensitive information, including authentication tokens from previous users. Um, the other thing is uh, Pentest partners, they've, they've got some awesome like BBC shows and you can watch them online. And they, they found a number, several, several problems. But my absolute favorite is, is the situation where you have an EV charger that's basically a, a Raspberry Pi in a box, and that's this EO hub. And so if you take the panel off this thing, you see this board in here, and that board you may recognize as a Raspberry Pi. So hobbyist, uh, small, single board computer. Problem with those is everything associated with that device is on a micro SD card sitting right there. Pull that out, you have everything. You can down, you, you see the entire structure of the Linux um, file structure. You've got access to everything. You can add your own username. You can then log into it and you can do whatever you want. You can dump FTP credentials, et cetera. Keep touching the touch board. Um, and so this is this is a major problem, right? So very, very simple uh, way to, to gain um, access to very sensitive information. And imagine you're a homeowner, right? Maybe you got this thing outside. You tell it, okay, connect to the internet so I can get data back and see my charging and how, how things are going. Now you've got your home Wi-Fi stored on that card. Somebody comes by, pops it up, scans it. Now they've got your home Wi-Fi and they can, they can do malicious things. Or even worse, this is on like a corporate network. And so now you've got access to the corporate network and you could steal it was for like espionage, corporate espionage, stealing and doing something nefarious with, with the corporate systems. Yeah, you ever hear about the, the uh, casino that was hacked through the fish tank in Vegas? <laughs> so the, this is kind of a, one of the problems with the IoT devices, right? So Internet of Things devices, smart thermostats, smart uh, refrigerators. There's a, a hotel uh, in Las Vegas that had a smart fish tank uh, thermometer. Told you, you know, make sure the fish are alive and all that. They put it on their corporate network. Somebody was able to hack into that, through that, to get onto that network and, and steal a high roll of database of all the, all the big shots associated with that casino. So very similar things here can happen. How do they sell fried fish? Yeah. All right, so what's all this mean? I've been blabbing on and on and on. You guys are falling asleep. Okay, so uh, what does this mean? Okay, I've, I've told you about all these historical problems, uh, told you about various interfaces that can be exploited, so forth. Well, what it means at the ground level is a couple of things. One is you can disable a single device. Probably very frustrating, but these things go down all the time, and so maybe not as big a deal. But what gets much worse is if you're disabling entire fleets or you're controlling at, at kind of a national level um, load changes. And so that'll get down here to the, the grid side of things. Um, you can prevent charging, so denial of charging. Um, and what's really concerning to the federal government, and I think rightly so, is as we electrify more of our critical services, that can be uh, medical vehicles, um, you know, postal vehicles, uh, law enforcement, FBI vehicles. If we are unable to charge, that will shut down the ability of those uh, critical functions in the US government. And so um, there's a lot of uh, interest right now in preventing these types of things from propagating into other adjacent critical infrastructures, which which transportation, of course, touches on all. Of it. 
Uh, you also have financial and privacy things. I talked a lot about PII, like your Wi-Fi passwords, et cetera, billing information, credit card information, et cetera. Uh, corporate espionage, we talked about that. Safety, I'm just looking at the clock. Um, so there are a couple of interesting safety things here. Uh, one is for these large uh, DC fast chargers, you've got um, uh, typically it's two helical cooling lines that run down the length of it. And there's a pump, the, the heat exchanger, because you're, you're delivering a tremendous amount of amperage, a lot of current to the vehicle. And so you have to cool it. It actually reduces the weight of this really heavy cable. It's already heavy enough. Uh, uh, by by cool liquid cooling them, so the the weight of the water is actually reduces the weight of the the metal needed to carry the same electric um, power to the vehicle. So if you disable the pump or you disable something associated with that cooling system, that cable gets very warm. It'll derate typically, but it's still you know hot to touch. Uh, so that's one thing. And then there's there's a lot of talk about, okay, are you gonna like blow up the batteries or do something there? That's, that's actually extremely difficult to do because there are safety systems on both sides of the charger side and the vehicle side and you would have to compromise both of those. So it's, it's actually, that is fortunately very, very difficult. But in theory, you disabled such protections um, and some of these are, are quite mechanical, uh, then you could, you could cause issues there. And then I'm gonna go into the grid side in a little bit more detail uh, to really put you asleep, uh, but there's there's protection issues and there's also local and bulk, uh, meaning uh, transmission level problems. So at the distribution level, what does distribution mean? How many power engineers in here? Anyone? Oh, oh I think this is the first audience I've ever talked to. That's, there's no power engineers in the. <laughs> All right. Well. How does the power system work, right? Well, it's changing, but in general, you have very large, typically thermal generators, uh, you know, your gas power plants, oil, coal, nuclear power plants, et cetera. Step up transformer goes to very high, high voltages, goes a very long way. Step down in, in your local area to a, a substation that then is a distribution substation attached to that. And then that distribution substation radiates um, in kind of a radial pattern to all the homes at, at you know, 1247, 12 12.47 kilovolts, right? Uh, or, or down to like 480 and then, then your plug outlets here at 120. So it, it steps down and on that radial branch, if you have an electric vehicle and it is charging, it's, it's a load and it's gonna pull down your voltage. And if you inject power into it, if it's like a bi-directional charger or solar or other, it'll push up the voltage. And so you, you kind of think of it from the substation as like a fulcrum here. So if you put a very large um, EV charger at the end of this thing, like those examples I was talking about, like out in Kansas, where you don't have a very strong grid, it's very weak, you can move this around. You can move that voltage significantly. And so we ran some simulations here for, uh, let's see, nine 250 kilowatt chargers at the end of a feeder, feeder meaning a distribution circuit, um, and, and showed how far that could swing. And if you use reactive power, uh, I'm just going to, let's just say you can move the voltage a lot. I won't get into the details. And the grid operators are required to maintain that voltage between ANSI range a limits, which are plus and minus five percent. So why does this matter? It can hurt pumps, it can do other things. So at the distribution level, grid support functions are great if they're used appropriately and can be dangerous if they're used inappropriately because they can move that voltage significantly. The bulk system level, the transmission level, uh, there's there's a lot that can go on um, as well. And so we were, we uh, meaning, uh, myself and, and really the PNNL team that, that was running this project uh, did several different studies using a WAC simulation. So the Western Interconnect, the U.S. grid is actually like three grids, right? And Western Interconnect, Eastern Interconnect, and then Texas, ERCOT. And so if you take the, the, the West one, the WEC, um, and you run simulations, 
we were looking at what happens if you simultaneously shut off a bunch of these EV chargers. You get this huge low drop event. And what we found is even for 10 gigawatts, nothing, nothing really happened. Great. Okay. But we, we then said, okay, what if you coordinated this thing where you, where you actually caused, um, you know, some of these things to, to oscillate across this north-south mode here. And so this is, this is an issue that happens in power systems where you get these inner area oscillations where it kind of vibrates against each other at about, I think the north-south mode A is like 1.17 hertz, so like every five seconds, something like that, pretty slow. But you get these, you get these kind of oscillations that's caused blackouts in the past. Actually, Sandia, as an aside, designed a controller to, to um, there's a huge DC uh, link between uh, up here, up here uh, where all the hydro plants are in Washington and Oregon, down to uh, San Diego. And we, uh, Sandia designed a controller to modulate the DC connection at a, at a little level to dampen out those inner area oscillations. It was a big success. Anyway, um, th so so these inner area oscillations, if you if you swing um, the loads against one another, you can actually only 500 megawatts. You start to get a 3x multiplier on the California Oregon intertie here, and this can this can cause uh, some some issues. What we found is you get a little bit of load drop based on the, the power protection issues, but no generation was tripped. And so it's not, not gonna have a blackout, but we start to uh, see uh, some challenges there. So you say, okay, okay, well, that's interesting, but that's gonna be really difficult for a nation state or somebody else to pull off. Yes, absolutely. Um, but that brings me to a couple of stories here. And I'm looking at the time, so I'm gonna try to be quick here. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea here is that um, electric vehicle supply equipment is an industrial Internet of Things device. It has all these connections. If you have common mode vulnerabilities, meaning the same issue can propagate across the entire fleet, you get into really scary territory. And that is precisely what this guy Sebastian demonstrated this last December at the Chaos Communication Congress in Hamburg, um, not for an EBSE, but for a, a microinverter company uh, called the Hoy Miles here, where he developed an exploit that, that triggered a logic bomb to actually change the way the power stage on this device worked. And so he could operate the AC rate relay open and closing it, could Yeah. In my shadow, uh, you could you could produce uh, reactive power, total harmonic distortion, etc. And uh, so, let me show you actually what this looks like. I don't think I have. Fortunately, I don't know if the audio is going to work, but we'll try. Um, so let me set the stage. It's like an hour long talk. Really encourage you to watch it if you're curious about this type of thing. Um, but Essentially, here, here he, he goes through this long explanation about how he can compromise these devices. He, he gains remote access. Uh, and then he actually changes the firmware of the device to do various things. So the first, first example, play here. Um, and I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to have audio. That's all right. So the first example, is he's going to actuate the AC relay on the on this microinverter. So a little bit different than than a electric vehicle charger, but it's essentially the same concept. You got some communication interface and a power stage. You can see he's click 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 click. It's it's great when you use audio because it's like clack 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 clack. Obviously terrible for the power system, right? Because you're basically cycling. I don't know, like maybe 0.5 hertz. Uh, this uh, the uh, AC relay on this device. Next up, he, he tries to modify the pulse width modulation control signal to the H bridge. So the, in this case, MOSFETs, not IGPTs. Um, and he's trying to heat this thing up 
right? So he wants to heat up the device to see if it'll like derate or do something else. And what happens? Sitting there, bang. You hear a loud bang in the video. Imagine it goes bang. And applause. <laughs> and then applause. And uh, so they're like, okay, well, that's interesting. What just happened? So he walks over, opens up his breaker panel, and realizes the AC breaker has been tripped. So he updated the control firmware, and he demonstrates how this could be done remotely, by the way, uh, in a way that it actually triggered uh, protection in, in his home. And so you can kind of uh, imagine uh, doing this very similar things for electric vehicle chargers uh, across like a very large geographic area. And so now you're not just like turning off the device, right? You're actually impacting people's home power. Uh, and, and if you're not you know, right there and know what's going on and it does it every time you turn the thing on, it's gonna, yeah going to upset a lot of people. Okay, so let's let's bring this back to uh, risks. So uh, I'll go very briefly over this, but so if you if you want to talk about risk, typically you, the way that you do it is you, you talk about the likelihood times the consequence. So in terms of power systems, the likelihood of something happening almost certainly is really easy stuff. You know, script kitty stuff, you know, any old hacker downloads it off GitHub, runs the code. Okay. And so this tends to be, this is bad, almost certain, right? Really easy to do. And then severe outage blackouts. So you make this, this chart. And so if it's rare, meaning really difficult to do, um, that that's your, you know, nation states that take several years, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop some exploit. Um, if it's insignificant, doesn't actually infect anything, that's, that's fine, that's green. But if it can cause severe outage um, for an extended period of time, then it's red. And then almost certain here. So we, we did this analysis. We found nothing was almost uh, certain. That's good. Um, and nothing really fit over here because um, the penetration levels of electric vehicle charges just weren't enough to disrupt transmission level things. But we did we did start to see some things here based on our experience in all these uh, penetration testing uh, works. And so, um, you know, just kind of plotting this up and, and putting it in context, I think is helpful. So I know we have, we want to do a few minutes of q and A. I will I will do maybe. To, I don't know, I'll try to get through the next few slides, this next section very, very quickly. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring it to some questions. So a lot of guidance out there on how to do this, but a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of papers. Um, there's, there's some great work out of the Netherlands. There's work from the national labs. There's work from the joint office, DOE, DOT. Um, there's, there's work at like INL, this, this project that I was talking about, we were a part of, and then, uh, the EVSC um, uh, paper that, I, that that we wrote at Sandia also has uh, a lot of research areas where improvements could be made. And I highlight here EVSC network-based intrusion detection systems and mitigation. And here's a chart if you'd like to look it up that Sandia put together for best practices. Uh, but I'm going to jump into two things. Actually, I'm just going to jump. Should have done this in a different order. Okay, we're almost done, promise. Let's see what I'm gonna say. Uh, so a couple of things. One is we have an awesome new project, UE Caesar funded $5 million project to work with the partners you see on the right to do anomaly detection and um, response for these types of attacks. So if there's anything going on nefariously on the communication networks, especially at the head end systems in the cloud, we're going to run that um, decrypt the traffic, analyze the traffic using several different tools here to look for physical um, abnormalities or anomalies, uh, looking at antivirus rules, ER rules, detonating them in a sandbox that represents their backend systems, and then applying some AI ML uh, technologies. And so this is, this is kind of what this looks like if you draw it out, is you've got your charging depots, your, your public chargers, runs through the internet and then our uh, DERSEC detective here. We have intrusion detection capabilities. We've got our 
uh, security orchestration automation and response tool that based on the detection will remediate that, meaning blocking IPs, maybe even taking systems offline temporarily, reflashing firmware, et cetera, and then logging that appropriately in a security information and event management system. And then you've got your backend system over here. Um, from, from a technical standpoint, all those pieces fit into this broad classification. So you packet level analysis, stateful detection, digital twins, and AI classification. So we're, we're focused in right on this left side for now, but we're working our way right to, to do uh, digital twinning where we replicate the, the operations of the device compare that to the physical operations. And if there's a, a, a deviation of a significant amount, we can, we can flag that as anomalous. And then the machine learning work, a lot of great classifiers out there um, to detect when there's uh, nefarious operations on networks and, and with systems. So in conclusion, looking at the time here, uh, Cybersecurity researchers have done a tremendous job of identifying issues associated with EV chargers. It's a continuous process, right? You've got white hat hackers, black hat that are exposed, find problems, report those to the manufacturers, and manufacturers need to respond appropriately and, and aggressively to solve those issues and, and uh, remediate those problems. Bug bounty programs and responsible disclosure policies, of course, help with that. Um, state and federal government, is working very hard to come up with better uh, policies. And I know there's some management folks in the room and I didn't talk much policy, but um, there, there's actually a very um, interesting debate nationally about how to do this appropriately, states versus federal, who gets involved, what authorities should be uh, you know, consulted and, and which authorities have the right to apply certain rules for, for the rollouts. And so anyway, interesting, interesting policy discussions there, um, but it, it's very similar to what you see in distributed energy resources, meaning solar, um, battery systems, et cetera. And uh, so our, our install base is gonna continue to increase. We know that for sure. As it does, the this bridge between IT systems and OT systems gets more and more critical and we could, we could risk um, you know, the, the impacts starting to, to be more, um, more devastating in terms of power system impacts and other, other impacts if you get these common mode vulnerabilities that we're talking about. And then um, a, lot of, a lot of really interesting work, which unfortunately I didn't get as much time to talk about as I would have liked, uh, on anomaly detection and uh, intrusion detection systems, automating that incident response with, with these playbooks that can, that can trigger based on certain rules. All right. So with that, I'm done and look forward to the questions.